I think we can reopen the session again. And uh, as you already know, we have another talk here uh, that's still about the second spotlight session. So, you know, we have here Danny Silver that is going to present this paper, The Roles of Symbols in Neural Based AI. They are not what you think, and it's a work of Silver and Mitchell. So, stage is yours. Thank you very much, Stefano, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is work uh, with uh, Tom Mitchell over the last uh, uh, year. It's very much a position uh, paper, uh, grounded fairly well, fairly well on some good background, but shy on uh, uh, empirical uh, studies at the moment. There, but there's a few things I'll show you at the end. Paper's obviously much longer than this, and it's actually a paper in the new upcoming uh, compendium of neural symbolic AI. Uh, edited by Pascal Hitzler and companions, and that's due to come out, I think, in this, this month or so. So you can look for that if you enjoyed the session. Uh, really, the takeaway from, from this is to get you thinking perhaps a little differently, at least some of you, about uh, symbols and the roles of, of, of symbols. And uh, the important question, as you see at the very top, is the one we're all struggling with. How do we combine sub-symbolic and symbolic uh, representation and processing together? Um, the fundamental I ideas that we're expressing here is that symbols came about really primarily to, ex to express ourselves to one another, to communicate. Evolution found that was a good thing because it means that you don't have to eat that berry that might kill you, right, or you know to, you'll learn to run away from the tiger because I communicated to you. You didn't have to learn it from experience, less energy, less risk. But then something wonderful happened. Again, this is the, our, our, our thinking about this is that that same communication set of tools, those symbols, allowed us to start self-communicating internally, thinking about what we were thinking about, explaining what we were thinking about. Beyond that, it also started to provide biases in terms of inference and for learning uh, that were very useful, uh, and potentially uh, reduce the energy requirements of our nervous system to do some of those things. And I'll talk about that just at the, at the very end. So the outline here is we'll set up a couple of definitions, uh, talk uh, the background in the areas of, of neuro neurophysiology and nervous system that we know. Um, this is some interesting work uh, that Tom has done uh, out of the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon. Uh, talk about a particular co cognitive model that most of you will have heard of already, and then uh, think about what we have in terms of artificial neural networks at the moment. This may seem at times to really be very pro uh, neural networks. I think that, that we're certainly on that side, but it's not to say that we have everything, all the mechanisms in place to do what we're suggesting uh, here. So after that, we're going to, uh, I'm going to, to uh, tell you the basis of the hypothesis and a, and a small architecture that goes with it, and then look at just the two aspects of several we talk about in the paper, that of really how the explanation is, is reasoning and uh, a little bit more on the idea that symbols are a source of inductive bias and learning. So first of all, the definitions. Uh, concepts uh, are the things that we come to say that we know. Uh, we would still, I think, most of this room say that I'm different than a computer because I know something. I know what a cat is. I know because I've touched the cat, I've heard it meow, you know, I've seen it jump on things, I see it ignore me when I feed it, all these things. Uh, make up what makes a cat. Uh, apple, as you're seeing here. I have to put symbols up because, I mean, that's the only icon I can have to get you thinking about apples, but you've touched an apple, you've thrown an apple, you've eaten, you've smelled apples. You know those things as concepts. A symbol, on the other hand, is a mark, it's a sign. It may even be an object, another object that is a reference to a concept, a deeper concept. Now, the other thing we're going to reference in here is the representation of those two things. So a sim rep is an agent's internal neural activity that encodes a symbol, and uh, it's definitely going to be associated with a representation for concept, the deeper concept. A con rep, on the other hand, is the internal neural activity for encoding a concept referred to by, potentially referred to by a symbol, but it doesn't have to be. There are many things probably within your nervous system for which there are no symbols associated with whatsoever, and yet we manipulate them all the time. As a matter of fact, it's the larger part of what we manipulate. So two assumptions here is that agents encode both symbols and concepts using distributed vectors of neural activity. And second is the parameters 
that are learned, the weights of the connections in our current crude neural networks that have to be acquired over time through experience and that generate the appropriate neural activities uh, when given the appropriate input stimuli and, you know, context from our personal goals and things like this. So let's start with what, what do we know about the nervous system of our own body? Well, uh, and this is because of this wonderful technology we have in terms of uh, imaging. Uh, fMRI or MAG, which is uh, magnetic encephalography, does, it allows us to see down to the uh, three to four millimeter uh, space in as little as one millisecond shots at a time. So we can do some pretty incredible stuff. We can see that neural activity is spread across a wide variety of modalities with our body, representing you know, our tactile senses, our auditory senses, what we see, what we, what we hear. And when you think of something like tomato, the concept tomato, uh, all these areas of your brain light up. and They don't always light up at once. That over, it, we're going to see in a moment it takes place over time, but that taste center of your brain uh, comes to light in a special way with tomato. Uh, similarly, you know, the size of the tomato and your holding, grasping of a tomato and how it feels, even your intention, whether you're going to eat it or if you're going to throw it at someone, all plays a bit of a role at the time of the concept of tomato. But we also know, despite that this sounds very fluid and fuzzy, that there's actually some strong systematicity in the nervous system around concepts and, and symbols, too. Uh, but I'm really talking about concepts at this point. And um, so we can observe isolated nouns and images. And when we do that and we look inside the brain, for example, on the right-hand side over here, we're looking at, uh, at the bottom left-hand corner is actually the actual observed image for airplane for once at one particular point in time of the person thinking about airplane. And on the left here is celery. What you're seeing above it is actually the prediction by a neural network that has been trained on the verbs surrounding different nouns to actually try to estimate what those would look like. And uh, so the, we're at the point now where we can actually predict what your brain will look like if it's thinking about tomato type of thing based on uh, associated words and, and verbs and that type of thing. Even between individuals, which I find absolutely incredible, some, some extent, but certainly within the subjects it's possible. Uh, so patterns of final Neural activity for concepts have, have similar meaning and exhibit similar patterns in activity. There, you know, there is that word to vec, uh, word, word to vec type of embedding similarity in, in semantic space that gets, seems to get created within the brain. It's difficult to see all these things, but we're getting better at it, and as we get better at it, we can understand it more. So a couple of, uh, of other things that are important here is that uh, many of you may have read, read an article recently about how as little as 15 to 20 milliseconds you can see a whole portrayal of different photographs and you can answer the question one after the other, is that an object you, you recognize or not? It takes that few uh, milliseconds. Typically it takes about 100 to 150 milliseconds to recognize a word like cat as, as a, an icon or something that you know you've seen before. You may not yet know that it's a cat. That takes the other 200 to 300 milliseconds before you know that that's the symbol representing the concept cat. Um, how do we know this? It's because we can, we can take those, uh, uh, the voxels, the images that are generated by the imaging technology, use them to try to predict things like this one is predicting. So the uh, y-axis here is uh, time. The x-axis is the region of the brain. And at this point in time here, around about 100 milliseconds, is the best uh, set of features from the images to detect the word length, like three letters in the word cat, or whatever it is, five in the word tomato, or six. Um, and that is a bit of a clue that, okay, we haven't figured it all out yet, what this symbol is, but we recognize that it is the symbol. Uh, in the process from about 200 to 400 milliseconds, an array of different regions of the brain start to light up that really fill in the concept of, of, you know, cat. And this works regardless if it's the cat, word cat, or the image of the cat. It seems to work about the same. And it's independent of the language. Many of you speak several languages here. I try to speak two. Uh, but the, uh, the fact is it, it doesn't matter if you're saying chien or dog, you know, cha or cat, uh, the same areas of the brain light up in very similar, similar ways with, with both of these. Um, I, 
naturally there must be some language component that's actually differing between the two of them so the thought is that this first part is this development of what we're calling referring to as being the symbol representation sim rep and the later part referring to the really knowing part is the con con rep there's a other few other pieces interesting pieces here basically the exogenous attention period some of you may know if you've been in neuroscience it refers to that bottom-up involuntary sort of oh I recognize that don't know what it is yet but and the second part the endogenous is the more forced voluntary effort to try to what is that you know sort of thing is that a wolf I see out there in the darkness you know or is it just my brain playing tricks on me and similar how do we know that again is by tracking watch looking the image information over time and seeing how to in this case identifying the grasping of the particular object that's what this one is showing so from cognitive science one of the things that that's formed our opinion on things is this whole system one system to this dual system dual process representation process idea that I'm sure many of you have heard of just hands how many people are aware of this concept yeah yeah sort and popularized of course by Daniel Kahneman but it's been around for quite some time and only just recently in the last month and a half time I discovered that Ron Sun who I think was really at one of the initial events that we had with Nessie started talking about this in 1994 and a tooth by 2000 he could generated a something called the clarion architecture that has parallel some of the things that are presenting here today so system one is that fast thinking you know it's the on typically less conscious part of your brain that does 95% of the activity that you do throughout the day it's fast automatic it's you know has to do it's that thing that you do when you arrive home and you wonder how did I get here I just drove from work you know it's amazing all the decisions you just made but that you know you've done it so many times it's kind of on automatic system two perhaps only about 5% of what we do in our act has to do with the conscious thinking that slow effort filled logical sort of conscious activity a lot to do with writing speaking although one has to be careful here you know when you're reciting poetry when you're or you're humming and singing a song these are things that you do what someone automatically too but when you're putting that conscious effort into it finding Waldo counting the A's on this page solving math problems etc and most importantly has the ability to override system one and to some extent just like doing physical activities we can think about it training system one to do better certain ways lastly neural networks a lot of really interesting work of course happened it's happened to deep deep learning we've talked a lot about these this over the last couple days I don't have to spend a lot of time on this slide other than saying that they've they're providing interesting examples how we can build vectorial base to distribute it representations that we can process things that to some extent look like symbols represent words and phrases and meaningful and meaningful ways and they generate similar similar embeddings to what we've seen it with the imaging from the, from the ba brain and we now figured out ways in which we can uh, use attention and context you know so we can discover the difference between what we mean when we say bank in a sentence that it can focus on the appropriate parts of the sentence provide the context it's important so with these three different areas in mind what we've come up with is this is our hypothesis the symbols are critical to intelligence and they will remain critical to, to intelligence but it's not because they're the building blocks of thought but it's because they are the characterizations of that thought that self communication that occurs within us it allows us to explain our some sub symbolic thinking to ourselves and to others and access constraints on inference and learning uh, about the world um, and potentially uh, again evolution found out that we could reduce the energy in our nervous system significantly by using just the identification of much deeper and perhaps much more neurally active sort of conceptual concept uh, representations so symbols explain our thinking and aid our thinking but they're not the foundations uh, of, of our thinking it's a constraint that's occurring between those things and that constraint turned out to be a wonderful thing that a, a system that can perceive and interact with the world and at the same time can perceive the representation of the law that allow it to interact with the world produces something that's quite phenomenal 
And that's, I think, what we're all working to figure out how that works. Just like a song, uh, 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 sorry, the notes of a song doesn't convey the full music as was originally written and intended by the author or as performed. Uh, symbols provide only a gross approximation to our reasoning. However, the symbols, the notes of a song, allow me to convey that to you so that you can learn the song fairly well, but you're going to want to hear it, probably. Hear it played and uh, get the nuances that are beyond the notes and, and the written information. So this is a, a simple architecture that, that we drew up to try to make sense of what we were uh, saying. It naturally has the real, real world down here. Uh, these two components at the bottom and the top certainly are important. This is a sensory motor subsystem, subsystems of, your, of, the, of the nervous system of, of an agent, but predominantly we're thinking about the human or mammal in this case. So they're receiving percepts from the world and causing actions. One of the things I'm always reminding students in my class is we tend to think about uh, you know, symbols like cat and sort of thing. For me to tell you I'm thinking about a cat, I have to produce this really complex series of neurological um, signals from my body to cause my lungs to blow air out through my larynx, to vibrate, to move my tongue, my lips. All that makes up the fact that I'm conveying to you cat. It's, it's not a simple thing. So all of this goes into this system here. Similarly on the input side. At the top, of course, we've got our performance model sub, uh, goal subsystem, which is providing attention in this direction. So this is the downward, you know, we see what we want to see in the world, and this is the involuntary, you know, uh, stimulus, you know, being provided by the world. Uh, these are the two components I really want to focus on. Uh, the system one, again, the fast thinking, the system two, uh, the slow thinking. The system one is the uh, uh, element that's more it's semantically organized, but it's really grounded in sensory motor representations coming from the, the real world. Uh, similar concepts of similar vectors, and learned operations uh, are really just through mapping functions, simple su superposition, union, summation uh, of vectors. And this is a really simplistic way of stating that. It's probably more, more like a dynamic moving system, you know, various representations, but they fall within the mathematicians refer, refer to as a manifold, right, of, of uh, activity. On the uh, system two side, uh, it again, it's semantically organized, but this time the semantic organization has to do more with concatenative syntactic sort of uh, groupings or, or uh, the formulas of mathematic and language, how one fits word fits into the next. To some extent, it may have to do with probabilities and sequences and order and that type of thing, but it all has a lot, has a lot to do with the rules of these things. And, and these two different types of representations of the world, this one deep and built on our senses, and this one much more in that area of language and learning, is what makes these two things working together so powerful. We can imagine with this system two uh, things that don't happen in the world, which is incredible. That allows us to generate uh, imagery and ideas that don't exist, but perhaps could exist if we could bring the reality. And you'll notice that these two interplay with one another. Whoops, sorry. That uh, system one is receiving percepts from it. It has an involuntary intention happening to it. It's subjected to our downward goals and, and attention from that play. And it's also receiving representations from symbols that are being identified in the scene, if you like, at the same time. Um, and then conversely, system two is receiving all of those things, and it's, it's also receiving the conceptual representations as they begin to. So we envision these two systems as being uh, like attractor types of networks. We didn't spend a lot of time thinking of exactly how they're constructed, but you know that's, that is some future work. But the I basic idea is that they're working in a constraint, a dynamic fashion to uh, both uh, conceptualize the world and allow us to talk about both externally as well as internally what we're doing. So just as an example, try to imagine back when you were in uh, grade, grade primary in Canada, primer, you're learning about the numbers, you know? Did you have that book that had the three little ducks, right, and then the letter three under it, and the two little ducks, and the letter two? Uh, and you were learning 
what the character two represents and the character three represents and then maybe the addition of those two well or you know the question here is i via if i already have two marbles and i think add three more marbles to it how many do i have the left hand side is showing the system too so we assume that there is some very simple perceptual sort of uh, environment in the, in, the, in the nervous system that actually visually sees like these icons i've just got little dots here and the union of those two at the same time if you are learning to draw the relationship between the character two, which is, of course, every time you write it, it's slightly different, but you can recognize that as being, eventually recognize it as being the character two. And, and many of us will forget how hard that was. You didn't learn that in two minutes. That took you days to learn. Those who have children have been learning recently, you'll know that that's the case. We forget about that. In fact, it takes days for kids to learn to put their spoon in their mouth. There's a reason why they give kids spoons instead of forks when they first start, right? because you don't want to jab out your eye. So uh, these, these are potentially working together. Eventually, we get to the point, though, we no longer need to visualize things in this way. We just have lookup tables. You know, 2 plus 3 is, four, uh, is 5. You know, 11 times 11 is 121. That's not because I took 11 things and lined them up and counted them. We don't do that in our brain. Remember these, those various verses, if you like, as I'll start calling them songs. So once learned, symbols can help us explain and justify aspects of our thinking um, and to communicate externally, and we think reason in, in internally. Um, so I think I pretty much covered that. Um, I was asking some folks at uh, lunch uh, about how when they do math in their brain, how do they do it, and uh, the analogy here, and I had Tom and I thinking a lot about this, was that uh, uh, as I'm looking out into the room here, I, I foveate on a very small part of it, but in my mind, I see the complete room. I've created that collage in my mind. To a large extent, when I work on a problem like this, I do the same thing. I visually place, you know, one 1,539, put 12 underneath it, and I start to do the math, and I start putting the carries place visually in space. Now, everybody may not do that. Some people may use auditory senses or even tactile senses in different ways, but. Uh, I think we create that same sort of collage in, in doing aspects of our, of our thinking. Then there are things of which there is no symbolic representation. And one of Tom's favorite was we were building this was he, he would say, what's what the peanut butter on peaches taste like? Now, I did Google this, and apparently some people really like peanut butter and peaches. Anybody like peanut butter and peaches? I guess not. Anybody explain what peanut butter and peaches tastes like? Taste like? You can taste it, though, right? Kind of. <laughs> but words you know, are lost. Now, in terms of inductive bias, again, I'll go back to the example we just saw here. You, you're learning about three and the character three, the symbol three and its relationship to three things, but it's deeper just than those three ducks. You learn about three knocks you know, on the door, um, three winks, three lights in a row, three petals on a leaf of a plant. Um, three, that's how you know a three. But there's a symbol for that three, and it's a shortcut. You can use it for many different things. Um, so the sim rep for three, right, is related to the con rep, that deeper concept. And that helps you then understand why two plus three is five, because you put the two together. At least when you're very young. More complicated things, of course, are being done when you're, you get a lot older. Now, on this one, we did do some interesting experiments, and I'm just going to show you the, the very base, simple level one. We used an LSTM, and its job was to learn uh, to do mathematics with the MNIST, the noisy MNIST digit set, and we added noisy operators, plus signs and minus signs and divide signs, and et cetera. And uh, we, uh, uh, yeah, the goal was to initially just to, to, to produce the, right, the correct result. And again, I'm just so showing you single digits here. The, uh, uh, it did OK, you know, with a small number of examples and training on it. But the moment that we then asked it to identify each of the digits as they came in, or the operators, it suddenly did a lot better. What was really interesting is when we changed the encoding of this to thermometer encoding, it discovered the ordinality, the size, if you like, of each of the digits. 
and then it could do things like operations on combinations of digits had never seen before because it actually learned the relationship between a three and a two and a four that it was in between. And lastly, um, uh, the system using symbols likely saves us a fair amount of energy. If that generation of braid wine neural activity, um, you know, across all those uh, uh, modal senses uh, takes a fair amount of energy, then perhaps using just the, the identifier of the symbol, all right, and using that to do, uh, you know, basic reasoning, you're saying you know, one can imagine a reasoning system that operate efficiently in terms of, of these sim reps and then activate corresponding con reps, the deeper concepts, only when you need to, you know, fine tune them for greater accuracy, better understand and, and make a decision that's going on. So you, we can encode things a lot easier in that way. So in summary, uh, sim reps are, are uh, really not the, the, the fundamental building blocks of thought, the symbols, but they remain critical to intelligence because they characterize neural activity that fully represent concepts, or at least some of the concepts that we see. Uh, they're used externally for communication. It's likely how they first came about because it helps our species to uh, survive. And, uh, but then this wonderful thing happened that we can use them internally for abstraction, um, uh, levels of representation and reasoning, for explaining, and therefore actually doing reasoning, and they provide an inductive bias for future learning and inference of, of concepts, and potentially reduce our energy. So there's a number of questions from that. You can read those in the, in the paper, but here's just a few of them that we found. I, I didn't talk at all about context, attention, consolidation, how do you learn new things and integrate it? What is an imagination? Is it done sub, sub-symbolically or with symbols? Uh, and the whole evolutionary thing I think find really, uh, really interesting. You know, to, to, what, to what extent do animals use symbols? They do use some. Animals, you know, your cats and dogs, you know, you know they know things that they see as symbols and use symbols for, for you. Anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the audience? Hi, thank you. Uh, uh, you, in the example of the three um, cats, three lights, three, in the example of the three cats, three lights, it's easy to differentiate between the symbol and the concept. Um, but in the sense of cat, uh, where the symbol could be the image or the word, how uh, 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 we could also interpret that the symbol is the C, the letter C, the letter A, the letter T, and we could keep going down until the curves or lines and things. At what point, how do you yeah. draw that line, I guess, is the question. Well, I, I, I really like uh, what uh, Les Donnelly uh, presented to us. I mean, here's, here's the the concept of a girl riding a bike, which clearly is, you know, a collection of components. And, uh, you know, I think that sort of hierarchy of, of interplay of base uh, uh, objects and relations, it's probably the, the way that things are happening. Now, whether that's an activity that happens more like a, an LSTM over time and puts it together, or if it's more like a, you know, a multiple task sort of thing where you've got an inflow of things all happening at once, that's uh, uncertain. I suspect it's probably a mix of the two, you know, way at the back. Thank you. This is just to make you walk the maximum <laughs> distance. Uh, so thank you for the talk. It's really fascinating. And anybody in the audience, you should watch the YouTube talk from Tom Mitchell about his brain scanner work. It's really blows your mind, it's great. Uh, so uh, my question is about your notion of symbol, right? So yes, it is a token, and yes, it refers to something, uh, but often in definitions of, of symbols, there is also the notion of compositionality, that a, a, a necessary property of a symbol is that you can compose it with other symbols to create a new composite symbol that whose meaning is derived from mm -hmm. the constituent symbols. You didn't mention... Yeah. Uh, you just mentioned token, no, symbols as flat 
items. Um, is it because you don't agree with this compositional notion or you just uh, didn't get to talk well about it? What's your view on that? So, so that's a really interesting topic, and it was one that was debated back in the 90s, a great deal, between people like Zenon Politian, Jerry Fodor, and, um, uh, well, probably Jay McClellan, and, and the individual and the connectionist side. Uh, there's a really great paper by a fellow named Gentner, who talks originally about how superposition of vectors and things like this can easily emulate the sort of concatenative syntactic sort of compositionality that you're talking about. That was that was that was put to bed pretty much in the 90s. Yeah. But, yeah. but then, so that's one view is saying, well, you know, these symbols we can compose them, and there is a direct counterpart in how we uh, compose their neural substrates. Uh, right. Another view, I think, is saying, well, a benefit of these symbols is that they are much more composable than these horrible neural substrates, which. You know, you get a dot product or whatever, you know, uh, sum or... Uh, I suspect that's just because we're not doing it very well right now. Sorry, that's not a very good answer, but that's what I believe. You know, uh, I think Sorry, I, I'm not sure if I got it. Could you, could you elaborate? Uh, well, that, that, you know, the fact that at the moment it's difficult. We've seen several people presenting results here where it's very difficult to create embeddings, right. you know, that are nicely orthogonal to one another where you can do this, things. Right. I just think we're going to find that we get better at I that. I see. Okay. So you're not of the belief that saying, well, this composition is actually yeah. something that lives in the symbolic yeah. world. The theoretically, there is no reason that we can't do that. Okay. Yes. okay. It, it, it's like the, the issue of like the two-layer network can find any representation. Yeah, if you got the right search, search method, right? right? That's why we've gone to multiple layers because we've discovered methods which we can, by which we can do that better. It's still not perfect, but it's, it's better. Thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again. It's my great honor and pleasure to welcome Fosca Gianotti. I always find it weird to introduce keynote speakers because by the very definition of being a keynote speaker, there's no need to introduce you. People actually already know you. So we short so that uh, <laughs> <laughs> we do faster. So Fosca is a full professor at the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa where she was and is a pioneer on mobility data mining, social network analysis, and privacy-preserving data mining. You're leading the KDD lab, um, which I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, is a collaboration between the University of Pisa and ISTCNR. And Fosca won a ERC advanced grant, so those of you who tried um, know how hard it is, and she actually... Yeah, you, you tried the well, there, there, there is a, there's a couple of participants where I would be surprised <laughs> if they submit for a starting grant. <laughs> I think a bit of career advice would be in place then. But um, so she won a, a ERC advance grant on explainable artificial intelligence, which is a topic that is very close to my heart. So I'm super much looking forward to hearing your view, given your track record and everything you've been working on. Okay. Come to Nessie. Okay, so thanks, thanks for, for the nice introduction. And, uh, okay, let me put the timing. Yeah, okay, so my talk would be, uh, try to, to give an overview of what is going on on explainable AI, but particularly with, uh, with uh, a, a focus on sort of new directions that we are trying to, to, to uh, follow, which is in uh, explainable AI in support of synergistic uh, uh, collaboration, human-machine collaboration. So this is the, the mostly the work done in, in this uh, ERC project, and, and not only. So I'm trying to, to also to, to use also other contributions to, to bring you in this uh, new path that we are trying to, to design. So synergistic collaboration, human-machine synergistic collaboration. So, and the, the topic, so the, the, the problem setting is essentially, it's about uh, uh, AI improving decision making. So AI collaborating with humans. So, and uh, the question is that uh, which, so the, the kind of col collaboration that uh, we have in mind so far, the many methods that we are developing also in this uh, community, uh, have in mind just to propose something. So we do a very complex uh, a technology behind for learning from data, for adding reasoning of what else, for providing some help, some for the, for the user. 
So the pro now the problem is that, so what is the vision of the user? Should uh, you, are we convinced that all is the users appreciate what we, what we are doing? So do they prefer working on, yeah, using their own knowledge or do they appreciate uh, what has been provided by very efficient uh, AI-based diagnostic tools? So which kind of collaboration we would like? And who will have the final say on this uh, proposition? So now I, I do a game with you, a game, uh, it's not my, my, con my invention. This game is ga it's by, uh, <coughs> by uh, uh, Tim Miller that uh, in this ve very recent uh, paper was saying, okay, explainable AI is dead. And then he does a lot of reasoning on this uh, on explainable AI uh, and then say, okay, long life to, to explainable AI. So the idea is that, uh, uh, <clears throat> so there are two friends, so you have to take a, a, very, a very complex decision on your life, uh, and you have two, tr two friends that usually are very good in taking decisions for themselves, so you, and so you try to interact with them. So one is, uh, the first one is Blaster, that uh, uh, he always uh, say, it's always say what he thinks, uh, and then, uh, and then give you, so even when he's not very confident, he gives you a, 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 an opinion. He has uh, opinions and, uh, uh, and give you, is this helpful? Of course, if you uh, uh, always agree with, uh, with Blaster, so it might help you in changing your, your mind of, uh, and taking the right decision. So then there is Prudence. This other friend, Prudence, she, uh, uh, doesn't provide you an opinion, but she uh, asking you how you how to formulate an opinion, and then uh, also she poses some evidence against your positions, so help you in uh, arriving to a, a, a position. So would that be helpful? So, who is in favor of Blaster? Nobody. Who is in favor of having a, a, a suggestion from Prudence? Hmm. Mostly from, prud from Prudence. But Prudence, but she never gives you an answer. At the end, it's your responsibility <coughs> also to, to give the answer. So now the problem is that at the end, so the overload, <laughs> the overload is on your shoulder. Huh? And, um, I think that uh, it might be that, uh, that uh, we would like to have both. So there are some easy cases, very fast, and then I will come back on the <laughs> fast and slow reasoning. So uh, there might be very easy decision, very well known, so where the, the fast, uh, so the, the blaster give you uh, uh, an opinion, and then there are some times where it is needed more, more sophisticated, uh, sophisticated reasoning. So ideally, we would like to have both of them helping us taking, taking the, the, the decision. So, now, this is the, this is the point. <laughs> this is the point, and then, uh, uh, so the current situation is that, uh, so we do all these machineries, and then EI proposes a, a, proposes a, a recommendation, with also with some different, uh, different uh, probabilities, confidence of the recommendation, and then the, the person, the human, has to decide to trust or not the, the machine. Hmm? So that means that um, there is a something more apart from uh, providing uh, something which is very accurate with the terms of accuracy that we are capable of measuring so far. So there is uh, how, to, how to get the trust of the, of the, of the humans. Um, so because, uh, uh, so, tr so trust is something that uh, is very sophisticated. All at the two extremes of this uh, trust, there is the, the fact that uh, there is uh, too much over-reliance on the algorithm. So, okay, I use, the, I use the suggestion because the algorithm is done, so I don't take any, any, um, uh, any, I don't do any effort. Or on the other side, uh, so there is too little distrust. So, and in between, that is what we can produce uh, in terms of, uh, uh, so what the AI recommender, the AI as a system can, can uh, um, return to the human, but in, with the 
pos with the idea of activating what is needed for having the maximum trust. Not going, we don't want the two extremes, because in one extreme, too much over-reliance, so we are destroying humanity, because their critical, critical sense is uh, not activated, never activated, the, the, the critical thinking of humans. And on the other side, if it's too little distrust, so it's, the, it's like, I mean, EI, so we have to go on vacation, we don't need to, to work on EI anymore. So, so that's why it is so much important. And of course, so now, the, the, so the question, so can we trust EI-based decision making? When there is, at the end, it's a difficult task the, to, to, to take a decision, a very, very high stake situation, would be very, very important to have a, uh, the knowledge that the AI system can bring there, huh? but it is not enough that knowledge uh, automatically produces it. There is a, the way we, uh, we, we give it, uh, it's an important. So, so we have to imagine, so uh, thinking the, pers so changing the perspective. Huh? It's not only uh, having in mind to produce a, to produce a an answer for the users, uh, uh, any kind of the task that we are capable of thinking, but when there is the, this uh, uh, scenario, the collaboration, so we have to, to try to, to think what can, be, can help the user, the, to the human, to have a more intelligent uh, solution. So, and we have a sort of a small ecosystem. It's not a, it's not a more, the accuracy is something which is related to the machine. And then there is the good decision which is related by the combination of the person and the machine together. It's, it's the two together that we have to measure now. Uh, if, it, are we going to have a, a better decision by the combined uh, decision? Of course, this is a, a difficult, uh, because any collaboration, so we need, uh, what we need to do? So we need, uh, uh, good communication, trust, clarity, and understanding. That's why we think that, uh, <coughs> so <laughs> now we have to reflect, I'm coming to you, so we have to reflect on which are the, 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 the component of the intelligence, the ability of intelligence. And of course, at the human intelligence, huh? because now we have to rethink the things, not only in terms of uh, how we do the learning, how the, but also how the humans that interact with the machine reason, so which are their the cognitive process. And so those two systems, uh, it's already done. This is it's already explained. How to activate uh, system one and system two, how having together them active. So we have to consider when we do something that uh, we can keep the two systems the system together. Just a, an example, just, talking with the psychologist, huh? uh, so or marketing uh, people. So if you, if you say that the price, uh, the price of uh, uh, something that you buy is 50 euros, or if you say that it's uh, 49.9 euros, huh? so with, 50, with the 49.9s you are activating something that may you think that this is a lower price. Or if you say that uh, your, your system has a 99% of accuracy, uh, after a while you get your, the system, uh, I mean the user is get, getting bored. It's, uh, I mean, it's 99%, so th the tension is not, the tension, not the attention of the, of, the, of the neural networks, but the attention of the users is not there anymore. So you have to, if you say that uh, the system may fail, in one percentage of time, and the doctor has to take the responsibility for one percentage of times, you are acti activating the, the appropriate uh, cognitive process. So now, so we, we have to think to that when we uh, uh, produce, produce, uh, produce something. It is better probably uh, uh, producing something which is less accurate, but is capable of uh, uh, keeping, keeping the person in the loop keeping the human in the loop. Sometimes we are used to think to human in the loop, but the problem is how to keep the human in the loop in this uh, collaboration. So that, that's why we have to rethink also some machine learning methods, uh, so a sort of a self-aware machine learning or, or Socratic machine learning that is capable also to say, I do not know. Uh, 
so there is too much uncertainty. So there is, so uh, capable of knowing when uh, to activate uh, system one and system two. So for doing, so this is the big, uh, the big goal. So now there are, which are the challenges that we have to do there. First of all, open the black box, uh, so explainable AI, it's, uh, so the systems that we are going to, to produce, they have to, to, uh, to be capable of uh, putting the user in full control, explaining the why, the why not, and also what to change. And uh, also we have to, um, to design the machine learning methods which are capable of uh, even deferring the decision. Uh, not necessarily taking the decision on any instance, but also some de deferring, deferring also the decision. And finally, thinking, designing uh, interfaces for these collaborations which are driven by such cognitive uh, uh, process. They having the tension of the, those cognitive process. So those are the challenges that uh, I'll try to uh, highlight what is the current status for some of them. And of course, I will focus more on explainable AI because this is where we are a little bit ahead. But this is the, essentially the big, the big scenes. So now, challenge one, open the black box. Huh? So first, uh, so producing, producing uh, information out of uh, the, the automatic process, machine learning process, something which is uh, human understandable. And, uh, but, so the first question is that, uh, what is an explanation? Uh, and this is a, a, an enormous question that uh, started from Aristotle was asking <laughs> these questions. So, and it is strongly depend by, by the goal, but uh, who, uh, who is the, the, the kind of persona of the users which is in front? So, and, so we have to know the background. So there is a person that, uh, for which uh, a, formal, a formal representation it is, might be okay, so there might be a person that an example or a story. So, and, uh, so all the efforts so far, so now, I mean, explainable AI, explanation is in, in AI there since many years, but uh, there has been a, 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 a hype um, the, the last, the last uh, I say, uh, seven, eight years so has been really a lot of uh, research in the target. So, <clears throat> So, the, so far, the products are uh, the kind of explanations that we are capable of producing are of the kind of uh, feature, uh, feature relevance. So, uh, that, that essentially provide a sort of a, uh, so you, you give a, you, the system provide a recommendation, a suggestion, or, or a prediction, or a classification. And then also you have, uh, um, the, the measure, the measure of the relevance that uh, the, the features of that instance have contributed for that explanation. And of course, this is strongly depending by type of data. So in terms of uh, uh, if we have a, a tabular data, it, for each feature I have the, 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 the impact, uh, the impact of, the, of the feature, the contribution positive and negative uh, of, the, of the parameter of a, a linear model, for example. Or with sharp, sharply, <coughs> with sharp, it's another way again to represent the, the, the relevance of the features. So, the, uh, given given a particular prediction for each feature, you have the what is the impact, positive or negative, to that uh, to that prediction. So, and changing, and you have also the the the, the perception of what is going to change, changing the the values of each feature. Uh, that, uh, what may happen. On images, I'm sure that all of you know uh, uh, silence maps. Again, it is in the domain, in the domain of, uh, of the data type of images, and this time you have uh, uh, what are, the, what are the, uh, the contribution of the single pixels uh, of the images for that, uh, for that uh, specific prediction. Here the prediction is um, this image is a junk of bird, and then here you can see the many different explainers which are compared, and which kind of, uh, uh, of um, saliency maps they provide for that explanation. You see there is a, a variety. Or in the case of, of text, for example, again, it can be a feature relevance, and this time, in the case of text, 
So you highlight, so the system highlights the, the keywords uh, or the sentences which are particularly uh, relevant for that, for that uh, uh, recommendation. I mean, if it's a sentiment for that uh, sentiment. Or other kind of explanation are, for example, uh, explanation as exemplars or as prototypes. So this is a Gianco Bird. Huh? This is, remember the image of before, Gianco Bird because uh, the neck is uh, of this uh, shape. The, this part of the body is white. And then you can see also the, 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 diff the silency maps. Uh, and then uh, uh, you have a sort of uh, prototypes by the training set, not necessary. They, they are synthetically produced. But uh, try to explain providing exemplars of part of, the, of, the, of that image that were were uh, relevant for providing, for taking the decision that is a junk bird. Or maybe an explanation, a more sophisticated narrative, something which put together some multimodal explanation, images plus also test, and then description, definition, visual explanations. So you start to be a richer form of explanations. Or there may be Counterfactual. The counterfactual are another form of important explanations that um, essentially uh, uh, the counterfactual explain you why. So, uh, so what are the motivation for for uh, for the for the decision? But what are the motivation why that decision uh, or could be changed? Huh? So. Uh, so what have you to change for obtaining a different, a different outcome? So those features were too high, those features were too low. You may change this one, increase this, and decrease this one. And this can be done in form of, of, of routes, for example. And uh, so you can construct a set of uh, uh, factor and counterfactual in terms of, uh, of routes. Or you can do the same. Uh, there are. Uh, <coughs> Plenty of research producing factual and counterfactual in terms of uh, uh, image. Uh, in the case of images, so this is a this uh, spotlight was predicted to be a melanocyte nervous with a 99 percentage of uh, of uh, accuracy, and then exemplar similar to that one that were uh, that were labeled. Uh, let me pass this uh, expression, which is. Labeled as a melanocyte, where at this shape, counter exemplar with a different outcome, where where uh, of this shape. Um, so you you provide those images, or, and the, you can also provide the saliency saliency maps. So uh, I mean, it's an explanation is strongly depending by the data type, and then um, so yeah, in this paper we have done a sort of a, a, a survey of all from the point of view of type of explanations which can be produced, given the type of data you have, type of explanation that can be produced, and also which kind of algorithm. So, so for tabular data, for all of them, you can have, a, uh, you can have a essentially, so for, for images, saliency maps, uh, concept attributions, so text. Uh, for all of them, you can have uh, this counterfactual as a counterexemplar. All the data types uh, have this uh, special. You have also explanation in terms of feature relevance for, for graphs and for time series and all those things. So the methods which are behind uh, for producing this form of explanation so far are two ca big categories. So those which are the explanation by design methods that essentially they try to design uh, uh, machine learning methods which are intrinsically uh, explainable. Um, so the prototypical, intrinsically explainable is the decision trees, but also all, all the other, many of the, the, of the things that you are doing in this community, combining, combining symbolic and neurosymbolic are going in these directions. At the end, having, uh, having uh, uh, learning a model that uh, uh, it also contains, uh, uh, contains the, the, the needed concepts when, when it is uh, uh, executed. Or, there are the, the, uh, the post-hoc explanation methods that are uh, essentially they stay with uh, they stay with uh, with the black box uh, and they design a, a, a keep the system with the, an explainer 
uh, which uh, which uh, um, in, in another piece of software which audit uh, the, the black box and is capable of, of producing producing the explanations. And of course, you can have this uh, global or local. Global means that at the end you construct a sort of surrogate model and you use that surrogate um, for, for instead of your initial black box model, or can be local in the sense that uh, they concentrate uh, on explaining uh, that specific case. So the explainer just work on, on that specific case and produces a local explanation. Okay, so I, I will try to very short to summarize uh, uh, something that we have done in, in the project as exemplars of things that are in literature. So that is, the community is so big that we are not the only one working, but the, the things are very uh, uh, representative of what is going on in, in literature. So essentially with this um, uh, post-lock uh, explanation, what, what is done is that, um, so you, you try to construct, once you receive a, 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 an instance to be explained, that, you try to reconstruct, uh, uh, to generate, not sorry, to generate a neighborhood, a neighborhood which is capable of, um, a, 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 that you have a sort of a, a small training set. Uh, so a, a neighborhood which has enough, uh, enough data from, uh, from the different uh, outcomes of the, your, of your <clears throat> uh, decision board. Eh? And then you reconstruct a sort of a transparent uh, model from this small, small uh, uh, training set. Uh, so this, the, the system, one of the system that we have this LORE, for example, so the way, the way uh, you return the explanations in this local neighborhood, it's constructed decision trees. Out of this, uh, it's capable of producing, uh, producing uh, factual and counterfactual uh, explanations. With the same logic, uh, we, we made uh, also a, a sequential, uh, a, a local explainer for sequential, for sequential uh, data, in, in particular uh, health record data, where uh, the explanation is also enriched by using an ontology. Uh, again, you, you do the, the neighborhood generation, out of the neighborhood generation, you construct, you construct again the, this decision tree, and then you are capable of producing, uh, producing the explanations in terms of rules, uh, and, but this time the rules are enriched uh, by the, the, the medical ontology which is used, uh, which is used there. And then also in this, uh, in this line, there is this uh, um, local to, from local to global, so you have plenty of local explainers, and then you can combine them, you can, and you can construct a, a sort of uh, global surrogate, uh, which is a which is, a, 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 again, a decision, a sort of the global decision trees are constructed by, w from local to, to global. Other methods, again, representative of what is going on in, in literature, it's uh, uh, producing explanation uh, using the, essentially the lattice space. Again, post hoc explana uh, explanations, but this time using the, 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 the a transformation in a, in a Latin space so that the, the, the construction of the neighborhood, uh, it's uh, for complex data like images, uh, it's, uh, it's more feasible. And then, and then in, when you return in the, original, in the original space, you construct there the decision tree, you produce everything in the Latin space, and you return the explanation in the form of uh, uh, an exemplar. And an exemplar can be an exemplar of a, uh, 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 time series, so you have a positive and negative exemplars that explain why that time series was uh, considered that specific sounds, or, or like the image that I was proving, uh, showing before. In the transparent case, uh, so the one of the, I mean, the, the one that I like more is this uh, ProtonNet, uh, which is uh, on, on images that, that is, um, uh, this look uh, looks like that. It's a, it's a, um, a, a nice, a nice system where essentially what, what you do during the, the learning, the learning phase, you, you, uh, for, for each com for each uh, image that you have to classify, also you collect uh, the, the peculiarity of any of uh, 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 of any classification, so that at the end the classification it's like like doing a clustering. So during the training you. 
you also collect, uh, collect, you learn also a similarity function, and then at the end, uh, it's, uh, it's a sort of, a, uh, uh, I mean, uh, um, lo looking uh, what is the, the, the best clusters that represent uh, your, your image. And then there is a, a plant of work, which is also in this community's work, in trying to, to merge with, uh, with, um, with augmenting and injecting knowledge knowledge using a uh, knowledge graph or other form of, uh, that allow adding semantics. Of course, there the problem, as we have seen in several posters today, the problem is to, to find in the mapping uh, uh, from layer to the, to, the, to the knowledge graph and reconstructing at the end the, 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 um, the answers. And again, the Latin space, there are other things that uh, can be done, other experiences. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, try to make the Latin space uh, uh, interpretable. Because the problem is that uh, what you want to do, essentially what you want to govern, to govern the, the decision border in such way to, you know, to know where you want to move for generating a factual and counterfactual. And of course, factual and counterfactual have several properties. They have to be uh, actionable. So there are several metrics for doing this, but so you want to know where to move in the, in the, uh, with respect to the decision board. And this is also important. I have seen also one method uh, in, in the post. It is also important when you want to, the kind of information that you want to, to, to bring is uh, also related to the uncertainty, which is with respect to the decision board. So constructing a, 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 an explanation which also brings uh, the, the, the level of uh, uncertainty that you, that you have. Okay, so now, so uh, my conviction is that uh, a lot of work is done, so we know what to do. It's, I mean, a lot of uh, possible refinement uh, are possible, but in some sense, I think that the, in this area of explainable AI, the, the major ideas are there. It's a matter of, of really improving each, each single, each individual techniques. Now the focus, the focus, it's more on the trying to, how to design, how, it, we are capable of producing raw, let me call, use this term, raw explanations, how to, to bring, to bring this uh, in a way that, uh, that are useful for the user. And, but before of that, it's important also that, uh, another question, but it's explanation really impacting the trust, as we were saying. So we, we, made a, we made an experiment and actually I recommend that many of the people working on this area really also try to, uh, to involve the end users in this uh, evaluation, in this evaluation of, the, of the, uh, the quality of the artifact that we are producing. Because it is really important that for validating and also for learning really what they are, what they are uh, uh, wishing. So the experiment that we made with uh, an, health, uh, an healthcare uh, case involving uh, um, healthcare professionals, and so essentially the, the, the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, measure that we, uh, we, pre we pretend to measure trust. So the way we do it is like a, a medical trial. So we, we ask them first to do the prediction, so the, the physicians, uh, First, they, they see a, a, a patient history, and then they give a prediction of the kind of risk that was a myocard, acute myocardial infarction risk. They give their prediction, and then you divide in two groups, uh, one with explanation, one without explanation, uh, and then you ask uh, the final, and then you measure uh, the, this level of uh, trust. Of course, so the, the, and the, the experiment was designed by the psychologists, not by us. And they, we made a very, very uh, um, essential interface because they don't want to have other intervention in, in the perception. And, uh, and the, I mean, the, the, the was really a positive, a positive answer. So, but what next? So now we have to, so, so far, so we have the conviction that all this artifact may activate, uh, so asking from the users, so the, the whys and the what's, so 
So, so what about people like me? Why? What about people like me? What if I wanted to be uh, to seen as differently? So we are capable now. We have all the elements uh, for starting uh, uh, the next step. So having this uh, human-machine conversation that some of them are artifacts uh, that we are capable of producing by the previous, uh, the previous methods that I illustrated. And, uh, but uh, so we can produce a fact, a counterfactual, examples, uh, and then asking, asking more. But, but uh, the, the, what we have to habilitate is the fact that uh, the, the, some of the explanation that we provide do not satisfy the users. So the users can also provide us a different explanation. We provide an explanation and the user may say, okay, no, this is a different uh, th something. So we have to be ready also to start a, some process again, some process from where, retrain or reduce some steps from where. So, and, and this is the, the, this is the, uh, the, the important, uh, so the, the difficult part in the now designing the, the, the system. So the, there is this work from, from uh, uh, Stefano Teso from, and, and uh, Christian Kersting that is further elaborated, which is explanatory interactive learning. Essentially where, so the, it's a teacher-student uh, framework where the teacher corrects the student via, uh, through explanations, but the student may also be retrained. So and that's, uh, that's uh, a change a little bit the, pers the perspective. So now, so how to, to realize this, uh, the, this uh, feedback loop between algorithmic and human, and human decision? There is another interesting line of research, which are the, 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 the uh, machine learning that are called this uh, selective, uh, so learning to reject, learning to, uh, to, to defer. And those are systems that essentially during, during the, um, the learning time, they try to, to, to learn both a standard cl so a classification function and a rejection function a rejection or a defer function, depending by, so there are a couple of different uh, interesting scenarios, uh, or a defer function, where the users, in some point, uh, it is some of the decision are left uh, to, to the user. So you have the, so at the end, uh, so you have a sort of a new, new uh, um, uh, category of the classification, which is also deferring to, to the expert. And this area of uh, machine learning methods are particularly interesting, but do, do, they do not explain. Again, they pretend to give, uh, to decide, the machine decide if deferring or not, but they do not explain why should be, why they, they defer or not. So you see there is space for, for, for changing again this, uh, this method. And finally, last, uh, last, uh, last part is this, uh, Designing these the interfaces, which uh, which are uh, um, based on reasoning on cognitive theories, uh, and there is a, a, a line of interesting line of research by by people from cognitive science that are working on, on explanations, and they are trying to to uh, design the, what should be the, the interaction between the, the machine learning plus explanation plus uh, users. Uh, um, uh, reasoning on okay, so hypothetic, hypothetic, uh, deductive reasoning can be uh, can be interfered by system one and think and uh, causing uh, a confirmation bias. So reason, so reasoning in terms of a cognitive process uh, and also designing in terms of such cognitive process. So uh, so avoid the cognitive load by using progressive disclosure. So you you you, you keep things uh, by Foster appropriate trust by showing uncertainty level of prediction. Consider offering multiple explanation methods to enable explainees to, to triangular insight. So, uh, so, and that's, uh, that's, uh, so the idea is that when you design, uh, since the beginning, you, you start co-designing also the explanation part when you design the, the, the entire system, doing a sort of, uh, 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 question XI explanation question bank by any of the components of your, of your system. Finally, 
uh, the, the last challenge is how to measure this human machine collaboration. So, so making, so changing our validation strategy because it has also to, to uh, uh, include also the, this uh, 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 impact in the final de decision of the combined uh, work. So, so now, so XI move, uh, XI move to something which is a, a richer uh, uh, environment. It's not only the need of extracting artifact in any of the various methods that we don't know from the machine learning, but also uh, uh, how to how to uh, establish this uh, this co collaboration. Um, so, so the take home message is that uh, so sure explainability uh, excites so far uh, uh, has been focused on empower in individual and gaze undecided effect automated decision making. There are plenty of uh, positive things that we can do. A right of explanation, uh, at least in Europe, it's one of the things that uh, we need to, to, to equip our EI system when we go to the market. Help to people to preserve, uh, preserve better, uh, make better decisions, but also to establish the uh, synergistic collaboration human machine. So here are the, 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 uh, the bi biblio that we produced in, in the project. But uh, I like to conclude always saying that um, so we need to do uh, a strong effort for, for focusing also on the, on the uh, safety part and trustworthy part of our system. It's something that uh, um, we have to put our, uh, our effort. I like this uh, reflection that uh, Asimov made on the, on the is a book on robots was the introduction that I think it was a little bit reflecting on the many dystopic things that it was, uh, uh, it was designing. But I say, okay, uh, uh, we cannot stop. We cannot stop what is going on, but uh, we should put our, our energy, our energy uh, effort also in, on safety. We have done a lot of, uh, so we have knives uh, are made with endor, so that we, they do not hurt. So electrical wires uh, are insulated. So if there is something that we can do for reduce the risk, uh, we have to put uh, our uh, energy also in inventing that. So, and this concludes my, my talk. Thank you, Fosca. <laughs> Do we have questions? There we go. Hi, thank you for the very interesting uh, talk. Um, so in the beginning you were uh, having this idea of the human needs to know when to trust the decision of the AI. And then as you're going to quite a few of explanation methods, I didn't see so many that were somehow generating uh, confidence of predictions. Um, I, you, there was this one with the borders and you mentioned a bit that you then have an idea of uncertainty. But I, I think a lot of them, they're based from what I know, but I'm not an expert in explainable, but I, it's like a lot on um, identifying relevant features, uh, feature importance and so on. But how, do you think there's a lot more research needed towards generating confidence levels, or if you have any thoughts uh, on this? Uh, I mean the, so the, the research in the XI, so the, it's uh, so from one side it's in producing uh, producing those artifacts, but also keeping with the metrics, uh, metrics of those artifacts that are uh, uh, so uh, that make you confident on the on the form of explanations. For example. In the case of uh, local explanations, as the way th th those are produced are using a sort of randomic uh, process of generating the neighborhood, it may happen that uh, you, you have uh, the same, you ask the same instance to is explain it once, and then you have a different, uh, a different outcome. So, so the, the, the robustness of those system is something which is uh, strongly studied, so they are in the sense that the way those systems are constructed are for uh, accommodating such such kind of metrics. So, um, so the, 
if th this is the question. The confidence in which sensor, so the confidence of the, of the black box um, is there. So the confidence and the accuracy is there. And then you also keep the, uh, this explanation with adding some, uh, some other information, which can also be feeded uh, using the, the probabilistic measures, which are part of the, part of the uh, uh, black box. For example, the, the, the relevance, uh, the, the, the feature relevance, they try to uh, um, bring, back, bring uh, uh, out the, the, the probabilistic uh, contributions of the various of the various uh, uh, features, for example, the the Shapley values, the way Shapley values, it's like a, they come from game theory. So they you move, remove, or you bring, remove the, and give you a sort of a, a sort of measures what is uh, what is uh, oh, oh, uh, the, the also in terms of probabilistic contribution of that specific features. In all these forms of explanations, this is a, an important part as it is an important part also, some metrics are uh, related to how much robust those uh, explanations are. Uh, and this is a strong work. There is a plenty of activities there. And in some sense, it is interesting, but I, I thought it was not uh, that interesting for this community. So. <laughs> but uh, uh, in some sense, so far, I think that uh, we are capable of producing useful, uh, useful, but uh, um. Continuing on that question, um, I, I find it very interesting when people say that explanation must be trustworthy and when people say that users must trust explanations. That these are very different things, right? Because for users to trust, it has to be convincing. For it to be trustworthy, it has to be confidence intervals and so on. Any thoughts on that, on that, the dichotomy? <laughs> this dichotomy, it's very subtle. So, say it again so that... Uh, so, on, on the one hand, for people to trust an explanation, it has to be convincing. So, if, if we think about physics, most people, when they leave school, they think that electrons are moving on a fixed, revolving orbit around the nucleus, right? Not this is... This is wrong. This is, this is a wrong explanation. It's not true, but it is the explanation most people trust about how atoms work. If we now would look at is this trust worthy, the confidence interval of electrons revolving on stable orbits is really, really low because it's just not what's happening. So w what do you want for explanations? Do they have to be trusted or do they have to be trustworthy? <laughs> It's a nasty question because, uh, because of course, the explanation as related are related to uh, to something to be explained, uh, which is some 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 uh, uh, method that has uh, said something. Mm -hmm. So, in the second case, so when the, so if the question was that are electron electrons uh, 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 going around around, uh, and if the answer was yes by the machine. So the explanation say so it is com it has it, explanation doesn't add any truth mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, to, to at least it shouldn't uh, it shouldn't add any truth because can be sometimes can be also if you think that you want to manipulate it m might add something but uh, explanation shouldn't uh, uh, shouldn't add anything so the truth is the responsibility and and the measure of this truth mm, is the responsibility of the machine learning method. Mm. So now the problem is that uh, uh, the way you uh, you uh, return the, the, the what you add to this truth. Mm. So 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 far we are in a situation that okay, the way you return this truth uh, uh, present to me, or I trust you, or I do not trust you. So I try to add something that may convince more. But uh, if that wasn't true, I am convincing you of on, on the wrong things. So, uh, but, but users would probably rate the explanation as better. Yeah, probably I will convince more the 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 user with respect the wrong the wrong truth. Yeah. So. Um, 
um, I'm just continuing the same chain of thought. So you, you had this human experiments where you asked humans to evaluate a system and they trust it or not. Mm. You had this slide over there. I was just wondering, do people trust it because the explanation is something they believe in? Or no, no, the, the nice thing is exactly this, that uh, some changes the opinion. So what do you measure? That's the interesting part of the experiment. So the people have an opinion. They first give their opinion, and then, and then you have two different uh, groups. Uh, some change their opinion, and some not. And, and some not. In both groups, uh, without or, so uh, in both groups, uh, some of them changed, some group did not change. And then, of course, some were aligned, uh, already aligned with the machine prediction, some were not. Yeah. So that they were not, some of them changed, uh, and uh, in both in both situations, but uh, those which were more convinced were those with explanations. So yeah, I mean, what, what I'm trying to ask so is the, the way to measure yeah. distrust is. Uh, yeah, I mean, what I'm trying to ask is people who didn't change their opinion, even if the explanation was something that they didn't agree with, did they trust the system? They so those that did not change, even there wasn't alignment. Yes. There are two. There wasn't an alignment, and they did not change it. They did not trust. They did not trust the system, not yeah. So there's this weird interplay between yeah, yeah. you know, the beliefs that they yeah, exactly. agree with. Yeah. My Fitbit likes it. <laughs> Hi. Um, so when, when you talk about trust and explanations, um, do you think that post hoc explanations can be trusted at all? Because you correctly said that the explanation shouldn't add anything, but in a post hoc you're not really explaining the model but a proxy of that model. Do you think that can ever be trusted when you have post hoc explanations? Can you speak a bit louder? Maybe it doesn't uh, get uh, when you have post hoc explanations, um, do you think that you can ever trust those explanations? Um, because you're taking something that is a proxy of the model rather than the model itself. So you're not really explaining the model, but the model's proxy. So, so do you think that can actually ever be trusted, basically? So I'm explaining the model proxy in the sense that... Uh, so this model, this proxy, is built out of the model. Uh, so the, the claim is that uh, you, are, you are explaining the, mo the, model, the model behavior. Uh, so there are some criticalities there, so when it is local, because essentially what you are doing, you are explaining, so what is the, what is the, the um, so the, the, the guess of, people working on this local explanation, is that, uh, uh, so the decision border is very complex. Huh? So, and the function for the, for the, that describes the decision border is so complex that you have a, a very complex uh, deep neural network trying to, to explain. But locally, locally, so if you are lucky, let me, I will explain why you are saying this. If you are lucky locally, you may, you may very easily approximate uh, this uh, decision board, for example, or with a regressor or with a, a decision tree, with a very um, a simpler model. Huh? And so now, and uh, this is uh, in some sense why, so if you are lucky, so this, uh, this is a, a good way to, to, and you are not presenting there, there you are presenting the behavior of the, of the model locally. It is local. You do not do not represent. Uh, what happens? There are situations where you might be unlucky, and the situations are there when the, your point to explain it is very far away from the decision board. So, so there, in order to have enough points to construct uh, a, a, to construct a, 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 a local surrogate, so you need to create to generate too many points. So, and those are the, the situation where you have to stop. You say, no, I cannot, I cannot explain this. Or you have other methods, like the one that I was saying before. So you go in the latter space, um, and you have a sort of control of, you are capable of controlling where, what is happening. 
uh, to the decision board because you know where the gradient uh, is going. But it's but, but since you can be unlucky, um, do you think that post hoc methods are, can ever be trusted in a mission critical application? Because if you're unlucky and it's mission critical, um, you're still going to be, you know, not giving good results. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I agree. I agree. This is the, 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 the issues. But otherwise, you, don't, you stay with, that, so you, you stay with, the, with the no explanations. So staying without no explanation does not mean to stay without prediction. So, and also there are, of course, there are also di different phases where you need explanation. There is an explanation which is useful for during the design phase, the, the, the debugging of the system. And in this case, uh, even if you, if you are uh, in a very uh, unlucky situation, you still have the perception how, how the system is working, and that's, but it's only one part of the, of the in, in the other, in the other case, when you, so, w the limitation of the, of the local explainer, we know this one, that might be situations where you are too far away from, so you are inefficient, because you will generate that, uh, that, uh, but, I mean, you have the same effort than, uh, than generating the entire training set. I just have a follow-up comment on this. Uh, so I think if you trust your physician, then you trust postdoc explanations. Uh, can, can we say that? Sorry? So every time we trust a human explanation, that is usually a postdoc explanation, right? So. Yeah, but in this case, it's more a problem of efficiency than than uh, trust in this case. So. <laughs> So, uh, gentlemen, let, let's, let's interrupt that discussion here because this easily ends up in a bar fight. I've seen that happen more than once. Um, we still have a question here. So, what about uh, generative... Yeah. No. No. Thank you for the very nice talk. Um, I was wondering about uh, generative AI systems, like for example, ChatGPT. What would be a good uh, explanation uh, for a text that is provided by ChatGPT? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, this one, uh, I admit, it's one of the things that uh, ma many people are, are impressed too. So there are various, uh, so like supporters of Papa. I think it's impressive. So there are some people, for example, that uh, are seeking to use an uh, explanation for improving, uh, for, for, for doing, uh, for, for improving the, the, the quality of the large language model. But still, I, um, uh, I don't have uh, an answer for that. OK, Danny, and then we close for today. I was happy to see you included the social circle in, in, in the major components that have to be dealt with. Uh, technology, of course, always meets that significant obstacle of culture. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll give you an example. In a radiology department, there's every reason for me now for using AI systems to help um, interpret the, the, the radio images that they're, they're, they're looking at, but it's, it's not used that much. I'm just Curious, have you have you ideas on how we're going to overcome that cultural obstacle with these types of uh, systems through explanation? I'm sure that's part of it, but I think there is a, the humanist side of this too. How are we going to overcome those problems where now it's the physician who's affected? Well, it's just that uh, people, from everything from being threatened in terms of their jobs, right, to just not understanding and trusting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. exactly the problem. So, so in Europe, we had, uh, so like in US, there was this DARPA project um, pushing towards XI. 
in Europe we had also good motivations thanks to GDPR, which was a, 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 a law on the, on the, um, uh, on data on the uh, that was a, saying that uh, there was an article saying that uh, in case of uh, automatic uh, automatic uh, no automatic decision could be uh, uh, could, could be done without uh, uh, the right of explanations. But also in the EI Act, uh, the, the system at high risk, uh, uh, they have to be uh, transparent in some form of explanation. So in some sense, there is a push for, te for, for research and uh, technology to produce, uh, to produce uh, something. Huh? So, but uh, uh, the, the, the issue that uh, I'm trying to, 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 to bring is the fact that um, if you look, for example, to, to uh, health, uh, to uh, uh, EI in the uptake of EI in health, uh, is not as much that we were that we were uh, thinking, because the the, the humans uh, have this problem of uh, of trust. Huh? Uh, so, and uh, we have to. So, what are the things that we have to really to to do for convincing them. Of course, we have for, for sure saying the very basic things, like how was the training, the training uh, set down, what are all the statistical properties that we have, all those transparency stuff have to be there. And then also we have to, but if we just give a number, it's uh, a simple the prediction, even the, the, the number of uh, confidence of the, the prediction, uh, maybe, maybe it's not, it's not uh, uh, enough. Uh, so on the human side, you're going to require champions too within the domain. Mm -hmm. Physicians who will step up and say, this is the problem. This is what we Yeah. So uh, I think we, we need to have uh, some uh, some exemplar exemplar cases, and we we do. There is plenty of effort in, in doing doing things. I mean, for example, uh, the. the Having the, the feature the feature relevance, uh, uh, which is a very basic, even some architecture is not easy to to, and, uh, to, to bring, but uh, so the feature relevance uh, is um, so give you an idea of uh, what is going on. So uh, and if this is going on, something that um, activate uh, your knowledge, uh, which is convincing you, but it has to be. It has, in some sense, um, having some match with your uh, background knowledge. So, th I like this uh, this uh, learning to the fair learning to the fair system, because essentially, what they do is uh, they have, um, but there is still the work. So they have a, a, a training set with a historical data, some so called ground truth. Then they have uh, experts, uh, experts. They ask experts. Uh, to uh, redo the labeling of the the labeling of the, the training set, uh, it's very expensive. Uh, so, so it's like having a sort of um, uh, hierarchy of uh, ground truth, a hierarchy of different uh, of different uh, uh, label labeling, and then the system try to, to during the, the, the learning try also to to learn this um, this alignment between. What the expert, the human expert, m may be done, may, may, may do, may not. So, the kind of uh, something that I don't know exactly still how to really bring an explanation out of this. So far, they simply say, okay, the fair or not the fair, huh? but bringing also an explanation of this motivation. Why, in this hierarchy of uh, of uh, 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 labeling, there is someone that has more. Okay, thank you, Fosca. This concludes the second day of NESI 2023. Um, quick reminder, we still have a poster pitch session tomorrow. I really appreciate when people are living on the edge, but I'm still lacking the majority of the pitch slides. So if you count yourself among those folks, you might want to send them to me. On the other hand, as I said, I appreciate it if someone wings things. So hey, enjoy dinner.